then it's the uh, number five, five car, Jim Bodine, now running in the, the fourth position, or in the third position. He has moved around Rick Mast, who was running third. Mast running fourth. Dale Jarrett is fifth. Oh, a trouble here. Ernie Herman into the wall. Boy, he got way up on that wall, and Brett Bodine becomes involved as Dale Earnhardt narrowly misses three cars involved in this. Ernie Urban, the 15 of Brett Bodine, and the 57 of Hutt Strickland, and it appears as if the day for Ernie Urban is over after a very fine performance in the first 168 laps. Well, that's really too bad because he was having one super run here today, and the best race of his career, really, as far as Winston Cup racing is concerned. He got way up on that wall. You could almost... Uh, Imagine that car turning over, but it did not. It just slid down the wall, and then a couple of our other cars were involved, including Brett Bodine. Here's a replay. Well, it looks like he might have blown a tire because that car just veered straight right as he came off of that turn, and that certainly is not a place that you want to have a tire to go down, but I believe that that's what happened. And from another angle, we'll take a look at it again. You see the car does get up on the right side and was hit by the car number 57. Rusty Wallace hits the car number 57. As the other cars go by, here comes Brett Bodine coming down into the two car. Heavy traffic. Let's go down to Jerry Punch and Rick Wilson's pit. Well, the lead car, Rick Wilson has the Kodak Oldsmobile on pit road. They will change all four tires. They're working on the right side tires. And now they come around to the left side of the car, have the jacket under the car, Tony Glover and the rest of the Kodak crew now working to put left side rubber on the car. Rick Wilson has said the driver who did all the testing for Hoosier up here, and it's paying off for him. The tires are running very, very well here on that car. Let's go up to Benny Parsons. Jerry Punch, that is what happened. Uh, I saw Ernie Irvin as he came off the corner, was watching the car. He blew a right front tire, hit the wall extremely hard, and then took a heavy blow in the door from the Hutt Stricken automobile. But I did watch him take him out of the car. He walked away. They've now put him in the ambulance. They're going to take him over to the care center just to be as a precautionary measure. But he blew a right front and hit the wall a ton. What a, and what a super run he had going today. He sure did. And Hutt, uh, rather, uh, Ernie was kind of... Uh as we take a look at it again, you can see the car making hard contact, and then he really gets nailed by the 57 car. Ernie kind of walked gingerly to the ambulance, but it appears as if there were no serious injuries suffered in that incident. There is a cleanup, however, that will be going on here on the main straightaway to get Irvin's car here at Bristol because of an accident that occurred coming out of corner number four involving three cars, Ernie Irvin, Brett Bodine, and Hutt Strickland. You can see Ernie Urban's car uh, being pulled off the racetrack. There is Brett Bodine as he sits in his car. Repairs being made to it. He's being uh, interviewed by a radio reporter there. Now let's take another look at it as the number two car just suddenly darted toward the wall in turn four. He was leading the race and apparently the right front tire blew and he almost got up on the wall. Rick Wilson in the yellow car takes the lead, but he, the two car comes back down into Hutt Crickland car number 57. Rusty Wallace barely got through there, and then Brett Bodine collects the car number two. And now we will have a replay as it looked to Brett Bodine. This is the second incident Brett's been involved in today. Here's how it looked from his vantage point. He was going into turn three there, running behind Dale Jarrett, and then you can see the trouble happened up in front of him. He goes to the inside of the racetrack. There's Rick Mast coming down in the 66 car, and bam, right into the two car he goes. He just uh, decided to take the low groove, but that was the wrong groove because the car number two bounced off of the wall down to the inside of the racetrack right in front of Brett Bodine. There's Rusty Wallace, who narrowly escaped that incident. We'll try to reach him on the radio here. Rusty, this is Bob Jenkins. You got a copy? Yeah, Bob, behind. I'm busy right now, Bob. Hold on. Okay, we will not eavesdrop on that conversation between uh, Barry Dotson and Rusty Wallace as they're perhaps talking about information that should not be given on the airwaves so that other crews could perhaps uh, hear the information. But uh, Ernie Irvin was taken to the infield care center, as was Hutt Strickland, and uh, they apparently are okay, but both are uh, uh, being checked over. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, Ernie Irvin just stepped out of the infield care center, and he is okay. That's the good news, Ernie. I want to tell you, partner, a super run today in that Kroger Pontiac. Yeah, really, uh, Bob Johnson had that car really working good. And, um, you know, we were kind of just biding our time and trying to pick cars off as, you know, we could. And the car ran real good. Um, we must have cut a tire. You hit the wall pretty hard, and then you got tagged up there. I mean, uh, it, did, did you have any warning at all the tire was going to go? 
Well, no, none at all. I just, you know, heard it pop, and, you know, and then when it does that, there's nowhere you can do here. Hang well, on. Well, it's good that he's okay. We also like to report that Hut Strickland is also in the infield care center. He has been checked out and is found to be okay as well. Gentlemen? All right, fine run by Ernie Irvin. Unfortunately, it's all over. Now, here again is a replay from the in-car camera of Brett Bodine. This is the real time, and we'll let you listen to what happened. You can see the disgust on the part of Brett Bodine as he slams the steering wheel after just being a victim of circumstances and Irvin's car sliding across the track right ahead of him. Now let's take a look at our lap leaders. Uh, Mark Martin has led this race, as did Ernie Irvin. Neil Bonnet led for a while, so did Harry Gant. Bill Elliott led for the first time in 1989 earlier in the race. Bobby Hillen Jr. has been a leader, as has Morgan Shepard, Rusty Wallace, Sterling Marlin, and Jeff Bodine. And we're not finished yet. Alan Kowicki and Greg Sachs have also been leaders in the first 175 laps of this race. They're in, uh, in all have been 13 lead changes among 12 different drivers. Well, Jeff Bodine is leading right now. You can see the 27 car of Rusty Wallace right in front of Bodine and right behind the pace car. Rusty Wallace is at the tail end of the lead lap now. So he'd like to stay out there if possible and hope for another caution. All right, so the cleanup is continuing here on the main straightaway. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Number five car of Jeff Bodine in the lead and the 66 of Rick Mast running in second position. Well, since we arrived at Bristol International Raceway on Thursday, the weather has been kind of unseasonable. In fact, the weather has played a great part in what's going on here. For a recap since Thursday, here's our friend Benny Parsons. Friday morning, the Bush Grand National and Winston Cup teams were greeted by cool temperature and rain. Around 1 p.m., the sky cleared and practice began. Almost immediately, there was three crashes. That eliminated the four cars of Tom Ellis, Dale Jarrett, Brandon Baker, and Bobby Hillen Jr. In Bush Grand National qualifying, Rick Wilson won the pole, and on the outside, Mark Martin. Then it was time for Winston Cup qualifying. Twelve cars broke the track qualifying record. And on the pole for the second race in a row is Mark Martin in the Stroh's Light Ford Thunderbird. Joining him on the front row is Jeff Bodine in the Levi Garrett Chevrolet. The story Saturday was rain and illness. Rusty Wallace developed an inner ear infection that threatens his being at full strength today. Rain also forced the postponement of the Budweiser 200 until Monday at 11 a.m. All Winston Cup qualifying was washed out, and for the second time in the last three races, Richard Petty failed to qualify. So the King is not in the field, but Jeff Bodine is and leading this race as we are still cleaning up the accident that occurred here on the main straightaway that involved the 500 with 180 of 500 laps complete. It is Jeff Bodine, Rick Mast, Morgan Shepard, Dick Trickle, and Dale Earnhardt, the top five. We go to Benny Parsons, who's with Brett Bodine. Thank you very much, Bob. Brett, when it rains, it pours, doesn't it? Well, I'll tell you, Benny, you know that car was running real well. We got our lap back after that early skirmish with Butch Miller and uh, Kenny Birdwell. And I'll tell you, the car was really dialed in. I've never had a car that was just so easy to drive. You know, this place usually tears the driver up, and I, I feel like I could run 800 laps around here. It, the car was really running well. What do you think when you come off the corner and the world's crashed in front of you? Well, as you know here, things happen so fast. You know, you see it in the fourth turn, and before you get a chance to react, you're in it. I never saw the two car, Ernie Irvin. I seen him up in the wall, and then I lost him when he got back on the racetrack in all the smoke. And I had cleared Hunt Strickland in the 57 car, and then Ernie come out of the middle of that smoke, and I just had nowhere to go. No place to go? He's in the garage area trying to get the car repaired. Let's go to Jerry Punch with Barry Dodson. Well, Barry, just talking to Rusty Wallace, and Barry, what's the status of Rusty? How's he feeling? He's feeling fine, Jerry. I'm telling him uh, suck on that water jug. He says he's not thirsty. So he's fine right now. We got Dave Marcus standing by. We need to get this lap back. Well, they said they're right on schedule. They're a lap down. Now they're ready to win it. Going back to green, fellas. Green flag is out, and Rusty is indeed at the head of the pack, but he is now at the tail end of the lead lap. And Jeff Bodine has the lead, and Rick Mast runs in second position. Morgan Shepard with a very bad start. He got high on the racetrack and lost a couple of positions, as here they come for a complete run.
still continuing to go high down in turn one, so he's uh, losing a lot of position. Apparently, he has a tire going down or something wrong with the Valvoline Pontiac. Rusty Wallace trying to stay out in front of Jeff Bodine, hoping for a caution. That third car there on your screen is Rick Mast in the number 66 car. Now, that is not carrying any sponsorship. It did carry some earlier in the year, and Banquet Foods has announced that they will be back with Rick Mast as sponsor on the car for three more events beginning next weekend when we're at North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. They'll also be on the car for the Talladega 500 and the Coca-Cola 600. And there is Rick Mast's progression since the green flag run. He started 15th, moved up to 9th at the end of 90 laps, was 4th at the end of 150, and Rick Mast is now in 2nd position at the end of 184 laps. This is definitely his best run since they told Boy, that is something to see Rick Mast out there running. You know, that's the guy that Benny interviewed earlier and talked about having the triple neck braces, and right behind him there is uh, Dick Trickle. So both of those drivers really... This is their first Winston Cup races that I know of here at Bristol. Both of them are running awful good. You know... Dick Trickle there in the number 84 car who is trying to move inside with Rick Mast. He loves this kind of racetrack. He's an ASA veteran as we have the number 7 car of Alan Kowicki, the current Winston Cup points leader, in for a tire change. They go to the right side. Jerry Punch is right there. Take it away. Well, Alan apparently thinks he must have a tire going down there. Putting two more Goodyear Eagles on the right side of the direct Ford. Losing valuable time and last year in the 500 degrees flight competition. Kowicki now off the jack. Kowicki moves back out onto the racetrack and stays below that white line. But still, the valuable time lost there for Alan Kowicki as he had to make the stop under green, and here come the leaders. There go by, and he's at least two laps down now, Bobby. Lost the lap into pits, and it looks like there might be some smoke coming from the car, Gary. Yeah, it looks like maybe the clutch is slipping and not really getting up to speed. Either that or it's overheated. Uh, there's some kind of a problem. It looks like fluid coming out from the right rear bumper. That would be an overheated engine. Maybe that's antifreeze coming out. Uh, but the smoke looks like it's coming from farther up into the motor. Well, we talked at the very open of the show about how things changed last week on the track and in the point standings, and they could change again this weekend because here is the points leader having trouble as something is coming out of the right rear of that race car. Jerry, what can you tell us? Well, the car appears to be running okay, and then Allen has brought the car in and cut it off. Okay, uh, Allen is still motioning to the crew to try to figure out what the problem is. He is trying to get, he's getting the belts unhooked now. And very disgusted at getting the window netting down. A lot of smoke is appearing beneath the hood. We'll try to get a quick comment from Allen Woods if we can. Alan, what, what happened out there? What's wrong? Uh, it appears that the water pump on the car broke, I think. It just, I thought I blew a tire, and uh, I think the water pump broke. Well, that explains all the fluid coming out beneath the car. A tough day for the Z-Rex 4. Well, when you see all that smoke coming out from under the hood, that is a seriously overheated engine. It's like uh, the head gasket will just sizzle, the valve cover gasket, the oil, just that's, that smoke is coming from a severely overheated engine. And, you know, some drivers will get out of their cars and leave the work to the crew members, but Alan takes off the gloves and he sticks his nose right in there where the problem is to try to figure out what's wrong with that car. On the racetrack, meanwhile, a lot of good action going on once again. There is Rusty Wallace in car number 27, who is still trying to stay on the lead lap with the leader of the race, Jeff Bodine in car number 5. So far, Rusty successful in doing that and staying at the tail end of the lead lap. Meanwhile, we go back and find other activity on the racetrack behind this group, including the uh, run by the number 84 car driven by Dick Trickle. Now, he is currently shown in third position. As I started to say earlier, this is his kind of racetrack. He grew up in ASA competition, running tracks this size and even shorter. And one of my favorite quotes in all of racing came from Dick a few years ago when he took his ASA car to run at the Anderson Speedway in Indiana, which is only a quarter of a mile in length, but about these high banks. He said it's like racing there uh, is like jet fighters in a gymnasium. And I think you can almost apply that to this race here this afternoon. Mark Martin 
seems to be having a problem down in turn one. Several cars just went by, and he's back up in the groove now as he comes off the of turn two and hits down the back stretch. But uh, he slowed Morgan Shepard coming into the pit in car number 75. We saw him backing up there a moment ago. So Morgan in for an unscheduled pit stop in Valvoline Pontiac. Dale Earnhardt in car number three trying to put pressure on Dick Ripple for that third position. That's Rick Mast, who was running in second in car number 66. We'll go back to Rusty Wallace now, and we can see that there is a little bit more racetrack between himself and Jeff Bodine. Rusty at the tail end once again of the lead lap. He's really driving that car. You know, he's fighting for his lap right here. He wants to get back in the lead lap, but he's really overheated the right rear tire. I saw quite a bit of smoke coming from the right rear tire. A couple laps ago, Jeff pulled right up behind him. It looks like Rusty let it cool a little bit. Now he's able to pull away just a little bit, but he's definitely driving as hard as he can. Let's go to Jerry Punch, who reports that Bodine could have a possible problem. Jerry, what's the story? They just began scampering over the wall here in the Bodine pit in the lead by Garrett, but apparently Jeff Radio thinks the right front tire may be going down. After seeing what happened to Ernie Irvin a few laps ago, they don't want to take any chances at all on losing a race car and injuring a driver. He is staying on the racetrack right now, but Rick Hendricks, the car owner, standing beside me, he said that Jeff's radio did this a minute ago. He said they think they may have a right front tire problem. They are ready to bring him in and change two right side tires if they have to. Back to you. Pretty good record there for Jeff Bodine as he is the only driver to lead each and every race in 1989. And he has already made one unscheduled pit stop uh, earlier in the race and got a lap down, but then got back in the lead lap and back in the lead, as a matter of fact. But he's slowing down now and getting into the pits. So Jeff Bodine is bringing the Levi Garrett Chevrolet down pit road, and that will give Rick Mass the lead. Well, it started to vibrate so badly they just couldn't wait any longer. They were hoping to get a yellow flag, so they didn't want to be in. So they will bring him in, and they will change the right side rubber. They're also jacking the blade in the car and trying to tighten it down a little bit. Waddell Wilson, Russell Levi, Garrett Drew gets his right side tires on. Great right pit stop, he's down and away. But he's a lap down, Jerry Punch, as he goes out of the pits. Rick Master is leading, and now he's going to have to fend off Dale Earnhardt, who has caught Rick Master to see Jeff Bodine go out of the pits. And here is battle for the lead. You remember that Dick Trickle was in third a few laps ago. Not anymore. It's the three-car of Dale Earnhardt who has passed Dick Trickle and now is in third. As a matter of fact, is pressuring the 66 car of Rick Mass for second position as the lead continues to be held by Jeff Bodine. No, Jeff lost the lead there on that pit stop uh, yes, yeah. just a second ago. He's one and one half lap down, so this is a race for the lead between Rick Mass and Dale Earnhardt. Michael Walter put some smoke coming from his car as he came off of turn four, but uh, in fact, as he's in the turn number two over there now, a lot of smoke coming as we watch the battle for the lead. But Michael Walter in the Country Time Lemonade car, one of our camera cars, is having a problem as Dale Earnhardt tries to make a move. Here he is, coming out of corner number two. He'll race Rick Mass down the back stretch, and we'll have the lead going into three, side by side, door handle to door handle. The crowd rises to his feet, it cheers, and in some cases, it doesn't have quite as complimentary uh, comments, but anyway, Dale Earnhardt is in the lead, and there is the 30 car carrying one of our in-car cameras, Michael Waltrip, headed for pit road. We're going to watch. He's got a brake problem. The right front brake is gone. I hope he can get stopped here in the pit. That's what the smoke was. was every time he put on a brake, it blew smoke out of the brake rotor, so they, he has a blown O-ring on the right front brake caliper. They go to work on the right side of that car. You can see him working there on the right front tire in the brake assembly area. Anyway, they're trying to pound out some sheet metal that may be rubbing against the tire also. Yeah, he, he's been in uh, some very close competition. You can see some battle scars on the side of that the Pontiac, and apparently he was getting the tire maybe a fender in against the tire. They had that repaired, and he's back out of it. Let's go down to Jerry Punch, who can show us the tire that came off of Jeff Bodine's car. This may not be a good omen for some of those people who are on the Hoosier tires. This tire came off the right rear of Jeff Bodine's car. You can see it began to come apart. You see the right rear, a lot of crews. I mean, just about everybody on the front part of pit road has been up here to take a look at this tire. They have been talking to Bob Newton, the president of Hoosier, and they are really concerned about tire wear here. Let's go back upstairs. Caution is out. It's for the number eight car of Bobby Hillen Jr. And it is uh, Rusty Wallace getting his lap back. He did beat uh, Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt had run up on Rusty Wallace, but he did get his lap back. And here's fire coming from the Bobby Hillen car. Very definite fire. 
more as Hillen drives the car down the back stretch. He's got to be feeling the heat and is going to have to be stopping that car and climbing out. It's more than it yeah, appears. He's, uh, he's trying to get out of it now. Yeah, more than just a simple oil fire. And Bobby trying desperately to climb out of that car. Now he does so as the flames apparently have died down. But boy, a real close call there for Bobby Hillen Jr. He spun up in turn number three and kept going. Obviously, uh, the engine letting go or something dropping on the exhaust headers to uh, cause the fire. Let's go down to Jerry Punch once again in the pit area. Dale Earnhardt brings a good race Chevrolet in. And that tire we just showed you a minute ago, well, that's made them change their mind here. They are taking the Hoosier tires off and putting four fresh Goodyear back on the car number three of Dale Earnhardt. So they have watched what happened with Jeff Bonine. They can't afford to take any chances that this car hit the wall a week ago and don't want to have the same problem happen again. So they are down pit road. Great pit stop for the Goodrich crew. Here, here again is also in. Many parts is there. Vinny? Yes, I'm down the Harry Gantt Skull Bandit pit crew pit the area, and they have also switched it back to the Goodyear tires. Andy Petrie, fly back to the Goodyear. Yeah, we're having a lot of trouble with these Hoosiers right now. For a while there, we were trying to just scuff some Hoosiers, you know, get a quick caution to take them off. It looks like everybody's having so much trouble that we're just trying to try some Goodyear to see if we can keep up. Okay, and he's exerted after changing four tires on that car. And Rusty Wallace in the pits. He, of course, had to go all the way around the trap. He was in uh, just in front of the leader, Dale Earnhardt, so he had to catch up to the pack before he comes in. You can see there are Goodyear tires on that car. And as Jerry Punch was talking a moment ago about the tire that came off of Jeff Bodine's car just before Bobby Hill and Rick, Rick Wilson came in at the Kodak Film Oldsmobile. He, too, was running the Hoosier tires, and he apparently had a problem because he made an unscheduled pit stop under green. Boy. I've been through some of those deals, guys, where you go back and forth with the tires. As you watch Bobby Hill and walk into the ambulance, the, the crews, you send them all over to the Hoosier tent to blow, mount up some Hoosier tires, then you find out, oh, no, the Hoosiers are no good. There's going to be a big mad rush over the other side of the track where the Goodyear tent is set up, all mounting Goodyears now. So Bobby Hill and Jr. in the ambulance will be taken to the infield care center. We are live at Bristol Raceway in the hills of eastern Tennessee for the Winston Cup Valleydale 500. And today's Speed World coverage is being brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? By Pronto, featuring quality auto parts at lower prices. By Kit Car Wax for incredible shine and protection. And by your local Yamaha dealer, featuring the all-new FCR 600 motorcycle. Yamaha, we make the difference. Still under caution because of an accident in turn number three involving Bobby Hillen Jr. Let's go to Jerry Punch for a medical update. Well, I spoke to Bobby Hill just a minute ago. He's taken inside the infield care center here to be checked out by the physicians from the Bristol Regional Medical Center. He said primarily he's fine. He did not get burned, thankfully. The car erupted an engine going down the front straightaway, and we saw the flames here. It was a very anxious moment for Bobby Hill. And he did uh, suffer some smoke inhalation, so he is back in the infield care center being checked out. And we will, meanwhile, go up pit road to Benny Parsons, who's standing by with Travis Carter. Benny? Thank you very much, Jerry. I'm with Travis, the crew chief on the Rick Mass Automobile. Travis looks like it's going pretty well. Well, it's going so far uh, well for us, Benny. We've been able to miss the problems. We've been in the back. When the problems were in the front, we're in the front. When the problems in the back. So, so all in all, it's been a good day for us, and we're hoping we can stay up toward the front the remainder of the race. Rick was said he was not feeling too good. He had the flu or something. How, has he said anything about his condition? Well, he said he felt pretty good. Of course, he's had a lot of chances, to, opportunities to rest some during the race. So uh, we're in pretty good shape. We don't have to go the rest of the way green. I saw you, had a, you took a torn tire off just a moment ago. Uh, have you switched brands? No, we haven't had any problems with our tires. We, we feel like the Goodyear's, the Hoosiers beat us for the first few laps, but the Goodyear's seem to settle in and be about as good. If we keep the stagger right for them and keep everything running clear, uh, well, we're going to be in pretty good shape. Thanks, Travis. Thank you. All right, Benny. So the lead now held by the number three car of uh, Dale Earnhardt, but look at that car in second position, the number 11, as the 27 car comes in of Rusty Wallace's number 11 car, however, as uh, we watch the uh, pit work being done on Rusty Wallace's car on the right side as they work 
on the right front of that car. The 11 car is battered and bruised, but it's running second with Terry Labonte. Now, this is just the left side. This side looks pretty good, Bob. He's banged <laughs> in at the back. The front end is banged in, and the other side, once he gets around coming off of turn four, we'll see the right side of that car. He's running in second place now, but uh, at the first of the race, he was the car was not handling well for it. Now you see the front end bashed in on it. And also notice that Dale Earnhardt, during this most recent pits uh, stops, uh, Earnhardt maintained his first position. Rick Mast uh, lost two positions. He went from second to fourth. Sacks from fourth to twelfth. And look at Terry Labonte, who came in to the pits in seventh position and now has the second spot nailed down. And there it is, Ned. You can yeah. see how yeah. badly uh, scraped up that car. Good run. Good that he's not running a Talladega because the aerodynamics of that car are not too good for high speed. Even though they run high speeds here, uh, it still doesn't affect the cars as much as it would on a super speedway where they run up to 200 miles an hour. Well, Rick Wilson had a good run going after starting this race from fourth position, but he's out of the race, and here's Jerry Punch again. Well, he's out for right now, Bob. They're working on the Kodak Oldsmobile. Rick, what seems to be the problem? Uh, Jerry, I think we broke an uh, axle or a rear end. You know, the Kodak film of was running good, and then all of a sudden something broke. And uh, we thought it was a flat tire for a minute. It started slipping real bad. Like I had a flat tire, we'd come in, and uh, it broke an axle or something. We can't get it out, but we're going to try to get the rear end out and get it fixed so we get back out and, you know, get gain some points. Are you showing any significant tire wear with the Hoosiers? You've been on the Hoosiers the whole time. No, everything, what Tony's been telling me, everything's looking good. We just, and my car was so good, i just been riding around, not really abusing them, just trying to get some laps down. I tell you what, the car worked great today, and you know I'm just ashamed this happened. I think we had a shot at winning it. Well, I believe he did. A strong run early on by the Kodak Oldsmobile and Rick Wilson. And once again, the problems that Rick Wilson is experiencing could cause a shuffle in Winston Cup points because Rick came into this event in six points in the point standings, just 116 behind the leader, Alan Kowicki. A tremendous crowd, despite very cool and green, has just come out on lap number 227. We're nearing the halfway point of this race. The lead is held by Taylor in Jeff Bodine, the number five car, is at the tail end of the lead lap. Labonte is running second. Third is the 66 car, Rick Mast. Fourth is Dick Trickle, and fifth is Mark Martin. So Jeff Bodine was able to move away from Dale Earnhardt. You can see the distance there, so he is back in the lead lap once again after making a second to green flag pit stop. So he's back in the lead lap. We're looking at Michael Walker's green field there now as he follows Morgan Shepard, who is fourth in line. Morgan, a few laps down. Michael had some trouble with that car that put him in the pit for several laps, but uh, now has the car up to full speed once again. He is three laps down, however, the field. Michael Waldrop, three laps down. See Morgan Shepard trying to move around. Terry Labonte, who's running in second place. Morgan would like to get up there and get one of his laps back. Labonte has had a tough year. Ninth place for the Daytona 500. Things were going pretty well for him. Now he's trying to lose second position. Yes, indeed. Morgan Shepard passes, and it is... Terry Labonte, who is back into whether he maintains a second spot. Morgan did make the pass, but he's not on the lead lap. No, he made a best In fact, I think he made two unscheduled pit stops, and uh, he's just a couple of laps down. He's working. At, uh, Terry Labonte is really driving that 11 car. You can see it's not holding the line. It's, he wants to be down about two feet lower from where he is. There he goes down, slides right back up, and you can see as he slides on the wheel, the car kind of wiggles. There's where he wants to be. Slides up a little, slides up, gets back down and shoots right back up again. So the car just won't stay down low where he wants it. And now you can see up in front there that Dale Earnhardt has caught Jim Bodine again and would like to put him a lap down. Earnhardt sneaking up on the number five car. Trying to drop Jeff. Once again, Earnhardt's got his work cut out for him. He's trying to get Jeff back a lap, get Jeff, Jeff a lap down and trying to keep the 75 car behind him to keep him a lap down. 75 car appears to be running pretty well as he's pressuring Dale Earnhardt. Yeah, he's running good right now. From the Monte Carlo Chevrolet that both Jeff Bodine and Dale Earnhardt are driving has won 10 of the past 12 races here at the Bristol International Raceway, so they got a good record going. Now here's Earnhardt looking inside of Jeff Bodine. Oh, and Morgan the ball reflects up Terry Labonte. Exactly the same thing that happened to Ernie Irvin. All of a sudden, the car veers to the right and, and Dale Jarrett's in the wall on the backstretch. Morgan took a hard hit, and 
Terry Labonte right there, victim of circumstances in the wrong place at the wrong time. There's Morgan Shepard's car. Raymock Racing Machine is badly damaged as it sits just at the start-finish line, and the yellow flag is waving. That was a hard wreck. That was a super speedway crash there. It really was. And Jeff Bodine, of course, got back in the lead lap, and Morgan came down across the racetrack into Terry Labonte. And you can see the right rear hub is gone off of Terry Labonte's Budweiser uh, Ford that is now. So he'll have to come in for extensive repairs as the safety crew get there to attend to Morgan Shepard. Looks like we see some movement in the cockpit. Morgan may not be seriously injured here, but boy, I'm telling you, he took a real shot. Again, just all of a sudden, the car veered to the right in turn number four. Boy, that Terry Labonte, it tore his whole wheel off. The right rear wheel is gone, the housing broken and everything. He won't have very good brakes because there's no brakes on the rear, but he's got to be done for the day. You can see the crewman looking and saying, man, we can't put a tire on. There's nothing to bolt it to. The hub and everything's gone. We were just talking about how really a disappointing season this has been for Terry Labonte after the Daytona 500 ninth place finish. He has finished 18th, 36th, 30th, and 18th and has had a myriad of problems, and those guys have really got to be scratching their heads wondering what is wrong. There is the 75 car and the damage to the front end of the Valvoline Pontiac. There is a lot of fluid on the racetrack. You can see how it streamed from the top of the racetrack to the bottom as here comes the sweeper out to try to get up some of the debris. The track crews will have to clean up that moisture with the oil dry. Yeah, that was one of those type of wrecks like uh, Rusty Wallace had here last spring and like Ernie Irvin had earlier today. Just no no warning, just hits the wall in the fourth turn. We'll take a look at it once again and show you how this accident occurred. And you can see Morgan Shepard in the 75 car as Dale Earnhardt tries to move around to Jeff Budine in the yellow car, but all of a sudden the 75 car just veers out into the wall, down into Terry Labonte, collects the right rear of Labonte's car. You can see the wheel is knocked off and Shepard down on the inside of the track, so apparently a tire blew as he was coming off of that fourth turn. Let's look at it at another angle now. Okay, here they are going down the back stretch into turn three. Earnhardt in the black, yellow Chevrolet number three, trying to dip on the inside of Jeff Bodine. Here's Morgan Shepard coming up in car number 75, and all of a sudden, the car just veers into the wall, hits it very hard, then collects the car number 11 of Terry Labonte, and the wheel, the right rear wheel of Terry Labonte's car bouncing down the racetrack. By the way, that tire continued down on into turn number one, but it did not hit everybody. And this is what our live shot looked like, and that's uh, from our speed shot right under the starter stand. Just a tremendous impact with the wall and a hard hit also that Morgan Shepard had when he collected the number 11 car. So they're getting the 75 machine off of the racetrack, and the old medical center to get an update on uh, Morgan Shepard. We'll have that for you in just a moment. Meanwhile, there is the tire war uh, under yellow, but about to go back to green. Morgan Shepard in a terrific accident here on the main straightaway. Here's Jerry Punch. Morgan, a violent impact. First of all, are you okay? Yeah, I'm all right, Jerry. What happened out there? Well, Jerry, first of all, it just wasn't a good day for the Valvoline Pontiac. Uh, we had a flat tire, had to come in and change out after a restart. Uh, lost two laps then. Went back out, run a few laps. Had a right front to equalize, had to come back in. and. Uh, and then we was set to try to get some laps back and was uh, running pretty hard behind Dale there. And next thing I know, we cut a right front tire down and the Valvoline Pontiac went straight in the wall. Tough break for Morgan Shepard. Fortunately, he's okay, but the Valvoline Pontiac pretty well used up. Let's go to Benny Parsons. Benny? Jerry, I'm with Steve Neal, the crew chief on Clark Martin Star. You switched to Hoosier, now you're back to Goodyear? Well, we were, after about 50 laps, we couldn't run as good on the Goodyears as we could the Hoosiers, but they're tearing up so many race cars. I'm not saying it's not a count of tires, but we are real nervous about the tires, so we went back to Goodyears, which we think will run a little bit longer, but they'll be a little slower. Okay, thanks, Steve. 246 laps are completed as we're in Michael Walters' car. He is right behind the leader, and Earnhardt gets a little sideways in turn number two and nearly loses the spot. That's Earnhardt in the lead, and now coming up on lap 247 and three more laps. There will be $10,000 going to the leader of the race from the right guard halfway challenge. And it looks like that Dale Earnhardt is going to successfully pick up that money. The second place car of Dick Trickle is quite a distance behind the leader. Here's lap 248. Two more. We're at the halfway point and $10,000 to the leader.
Michael Waltrip, despite the problems that he has had during this race, is running very well in that country time car. Yeah, Earnhardt, if he can get, get back around uh, another time, he'll have that $10,000 pretty easily. Here he is. Halfway around. And the cross flags are being showed by Harold Kinder, and $10,000 goes to Dale Earnhardt from the White Guard Halfway Challenge. Boy, it's hard to imagine. You still, we've only gone halfway. We got this much more to go again to the finish. And look at all the lead changes we've had and all the action. It's some race, you know, typical Bristol, I guess. When the Morgan Shepherd accident happened, I mentioned that Dale Jarrett had gotten into the wall on the backstretch. For his friends and family, uh, he is behind the wall. They're trying to repair that Hardy's Pontiac and trying to get him back out there. Dale is okay, but uh, a lot of damage to that car. There's the second place car, the 84 machine, driven by Dick Trickle. Behind him is the seven car of uh, Alan Kowicki. Yeah, he was overheating earlier, remember, Alan Kowicki. He was in behind the wall for quite a while, fixing what he thought was a water pump problem. And then the 66 car, the white car there, the 33 and the number 9. That is third, fourth, and fifth, Rick Mast, Harry Gant, and Bill Elliott. Boy, it's hard to imagine that motor in the number 7 car still running as hot as it was. I mean, it was smoking everywhere that it can smoke. That motor is still out there running, and it's keeping right up with the second-place car of Dick Griffin. Bill Elliott, who had his best finish of 1989 just last weekend at Darlington when he came home in sixth position. Still, still suffering a little bit from that broken left wrist that he experienced in Daytona, but things are beginning to come around for the defending Winston Cup champion. Dick Trickle leading this group of cars. Really, it lets Earnhardt just pull away. Which he oh, we have a spin up a turn two. It's Michael Waltrip who is who has spun on the track and comes to rest almost in the middle of the track, but everybody gets on the binders and slows down and avoids hitting him. You can see the field passing beneath Michael. That car is headed the wrong way in the second corner. I don't think he hit anything, did he? He just kind of spun around? It doesn't look like the car's damaged very much. He'll pit on the back stretch. Going right into the pit. Well, he's pitting on the front stretch. He, he just pulled out there because that's where the car was headed. So he just went through the pits to get back out on the racetrack and beat the caution car. And now he'll come into the pits on the front stretch. Well, he decides not to even do that. <laughs> well, no. Jerry Punch reports from Pit Road. Well, Mike, what? Mike Walter made another lap to try to keep him losing a lap after he spun over there in the country time eliminate Pontiac and uh, the crew waiting. Well, apparently he did not tag anything. We didn't see any sheet metal damage as he came by. We are waiting for Dale Earnhardt to come in. Here is the car number 84 coming down pit road and he will make a, a pit stop as they will go right side rubber on that car. Meanwhile, the country time crew waiting for Michael Walter to come back down pit road. He again elects not to come down pit road, but to stay on the racetrack. So, Left side tires, that on the car number 84. And Dick Trickle now getting getting fresh rubber on that car. They have a problem with that car. The radio key inside the car is stuck open. And Dick Trickle can, they can hear what he says, but he can hear what they say. Trickle's crew trying to hurry. Jimmy Fittick and the rest of the Miller crew, it's off the jack, but it's still sitting there. They're trying to work that on that radio I just told you about, trying to get that repaired. And Trickle now finally begins to roll down pit road. They're pushing the car to come down pit road, trying to beat the caution car back out, and they will with plenty of time. Green is about to come out, Jerry, so he's going to have to hurry to catch up to the field because they were given the one-lap signal the last time around. The pace car comes off the track, and we're about to go back to green flag racing. Got to be impressed with Dick Trickle and Winston Cup racing so far this year, taking the place of Mike Alexander in that number 84 Stobola Brothers car. Green flag is out. Dale Earnhardt leads the Valley Dale 500. Rick Mast in car number 66 is second. Bill Elliott is third. Harry Gant is in fourth, and Greg Sachs in fifth position. Now, Kowicki takes Gant all the way to the wall. Yeah, something's wrong with Kowicki's car, I believe, and Gant uh, almost got collected up there. Allen staying to the high side of the racetrack, letting everybody else pass below, but something else has gone wrong with that Xerox Ford. It's been a tough day for the Winston Cup points leader, and I'm sure he's saying if this is what it means being the Winston Cup uh, points leader, I'd just as soon not be in the lead. Here he comes into the pits. Michael Walker comes down pit road as well. He decided not to change there a moment ago, but it looks like there's a left front tire flat on the car number seven, but they're going to the right side. Uh, we had a report it was left side, but they're going to change all four. They're going from the Hoosier to the Goodyear. 
And when you make a green flag pit stop, you lose a minimum of two and a quarter laps. Now they're just changing on the right side of the mirrors, and the seven car of Kowicki goes back out onto the racetrack. But you will see, here comes Earnhardt around him, and, and uh, Alan Kowicki loses another lap. Tough day for Alan Kowicki. You know, just inherited, or just really gained the point lead last week at Darlington. And uh, it looks like he's about to lose it here today. Now, I'm sure that we're going to get some phone calls because fans know, those that keep up with Winston Cup racing, know that you can't change. If you change brands the tires, you have to change all four. Now, I saw it. Maybe I, maybe I saw it wrong. Oh, and there's trouble down in turn one. Bill Parsons and Sterling Marlin involved in a spin. Nobody else is involved. As drivers took some very nice evasive action. And here is Phil Parsons now hit to the right way on the racetrack and so is Sterling Marlin but another caution period comes out and that's number 12 the record number of cautions in at Bristol is 15. We're Boy, hearing that. Here's a replay of what happened down there in turn number one. Phil Parsons had lost it up in front of Sterling Marlin and he tried to get his car down on him and simply the back end went around on it. Phil sitting in the low groove but everybody else gets by and I believe Phil stayed in the lead lap. He's one of the drivers that still own Hoosier tires as we see Dale Earnhardt come around. But what I was about to say when, when that happened, uh, it appeared to me as if Alan Kowicki put Goodyear tires on the right side. I thought they took off Hoosiers. Now I could have been wrong in that but they only changed the right side so apparently I was wrong because if you do change brands of tires you have to change all four a little bit earlier we had a spin involving michael waltrip and we'll have uh now our in-car camera go to work as we see what happened well it's difficult to say exactly what happened but as i recall he was pretty much running yeah. by himself out there so maybe just smoked it a little bit too hot into turn one and lost it i think that was the case i think the back end just went around on him and uh he was sitting up there on the outside let's go to benny parsons who is with terry levin Terry, you took one of the wildest rides I've ever seen at a racetrack just a few laps ago. Well, uh, the 75 car blew a tire and came off the wall and uh, caught me right in the right rear, just tore the rear end house and right out from under the car and, you know, spun the car around, so trying to get it fixed. It's really a shame. Uh, uh, it was the best we've run, I think, all season long. Uh, we really had it hooked up pretty good here today. They're working on the car. They're just trying to get where they can load it, or are you going back out there? I guess it depends how long it takes them to get it. If uh, if they can get it fixed and we can go back out and try to pick up the points, we'll do that. Good to see you, okay? Yeah, thanks. The bad luck. When they qualified, Mark Martin broke the track record, setting a pace of 120.278 miles an hour. Right now, the lead is held by Dale Earnhardt in caliber three as we look out the back blast of the Michael Walter car. Speeds tremendously over what they were last year because of the new paving. They weren't quite as fast as we anticipated. Some of the guys have been testing here at about six miles an hour over the track record because of the weather conditions we had earlier and the fact that all the rubber got washed off the track. We didn't have speeds quite as fast, but nevertheless, on a half-mile racetrack, these guys are really moving. There's the second-place car driven by Rick Mass. As you can see, as we look again out the back glass of Michael Walter's car, the interval between first and second position as uh, Rick Wilson is being passed. Rick just came back out on the racetrack. He has had an extended stay behind the wall as they change the rear gearing on the Kodak Film Postmobile. But Michael Walter has pulled away from Dale Earnhardt. He started on the inside of him on the restart, got to the first turn first, and uh, has pulled away from him, just getting one of his laps back. Yeah, you know, Michael Walter's running a awful good for all the trouble he's had. He's up ahead of Earnhardt, giving us good shots from the camera out the back of the car. After all the problems he's had, as many laps as he's down, he's still running faster than Dale Earnhardt. I, I kind of wonder if he's not on the Hoosier tires and Earnhardt on Goodyear tires. A lot of crew chiefs have said that the Hoosiers are quick right off the bat and then the Goodyears come on later. It might look that way to me right now. I think you're right here. We'll do a pan back here with our camera to show you the cars that are on the lead lap. Now, there is uh, Earnhardt and Rick Wilson. There's the 31 car of Jim Sauter, who is a lap down in 17th position. The number seven car many laps down because of several problems that he's experienced during the day. Now here is the second place car of Rick Mast and you can see how close that race is with Bill Elliott. This is second and third Rick Mast and Bill Elliott. Elliott sneaking up on the 66 Chevy coming off the fourth corner. By the way that is an 88 uh, Thunderbird that Bill Elliott is driving here this weekend but he's taken second position away from Rick Mast. 
He might be a sleeper in this race. He was running back in the field for a while, but just has been patiently working his way up towards the front. Now in second place. All right, we'll continue now our pan backs. There's the 21 car of Neil Bonnet and the 33 of Harry Gant, and that is for fourth position. Right now, Neil has it, but Harry Gant, last week's winner, is right there breathing down the exhaust pipe of the 21 Wood Brothers car. Continuing the pan back, it's the 88 car now, driven by Greg Sachs. That runs in fifth position as Greg is having his uh, good run again, just like he did last weekend at uh, Darlington. And then behind him is the 17 car that's driven by Daryl Walter. P2 is on the lead lap for the tight Hendrick Chevrolet. The 26 car of uh, Ricky Rudd, then the 16 of Larry Pearson. All these cars again on the lead lap. And the 28 of Davey Allison. Behind him is the number five car driven by Jeff Bodine, who began this race from outside row number one. Then the 94 car of Sterling Marlin. He was involved in the incident with Bill Parson just a few laps ago between turns one and two. And there you can see that Bill is right behind the 94 car in his 55 as Davey Allison moves to the inside and tries to pass the number 16 car of Larry Pearson. Davey Allison, who took a provisional here and started from uh, back in the pack, has successfully passed the number 16. So does Jeff Bodine and Sterling Marlin. Here comes the 55 of Bill Parsons and then the number 27 car of Rusty Wallace. Rusty still on the lead lap again despite some problems that he has had earlier. There's the number six car of Mark Martin. He was the pole sitter for this race for the second consecutive time in Winston Cup racing. Darlington and here again breaking the track record one of 12 that did setting a time with our speed runner of 120.278 miles an hour. And trouble and we have no crash four. It's Eddie Pierce fault. Eddie Beerswall has banged the wall up in turn number four. The yellow flag comes out for the 13th time, and we're just past the halfway point. Eddie's car headed the wrong direction in turn number four. But everybody has slowed down and will be able to avoid any further contact as Eddie takes the number 23 car toward pit road, and he's the first pit there off of turn number four, so it's not much of a drive for Eddie. San Antonio, Texas driver in the Americraft Oldsmobile as the pace car has picked up the leader once again, Dale Earnhardt. We're going to see pit stops this time, guys? I think well, so, yeah. He's coming down pit road. Mark Martin had pitted early. He's about to go a lap down. Let's see if he's going to be able to, to get back out in front of the pace car. Thank you. Yes. and the Goodwood Chevrolet comes in for four car change. Will Lynn changes the right rear tire. You see the crew cab with Will now dancing around the car and will come around and put the left rear tire on. They roll it in place. Will now looking at the tire. Four car change. Added two cans of fuel for the Goodwood Chevrolet. They're already finished. Kurt Chevrolet puts the last one on top. Down and away. Good pit stop for a four-time World Championship pit crew. But Bill had to beat him out there. He was a good pit stop. Really beat him out. Our crew cam, by the way, went to uh, Will Lynn, the right rear tire changer. Uh, we had it earlier on Horace Simpson, who was the tire carrier, but now Will Lynn is carrying it and uh, doing, uh, providing us some very good pictures there on the pit stop. Boy, those guys move fast, don't they? They get changed all four tires like that and get, get the car. Well, it looks like Earnhardt's coming, coming back in. Indeed he is. He's down on the apron of the track now in the entrance to pit road, and Jerry Punch will be there again to call the stop. Well, the reason for the lengthy pit stop was when they started to put the left front tire on, a lug nut fell down at the brake caliper, and they had to determine if they had the lug nut out of the brake caliper. So they brought it hard back in. They want to check it over very, very well. Children are looking at it, all the crew looking at it to make sure that the lug nut is okay. Also wanted to make sure the toe in is okay. Apparently, Earnhardt getting together with another car on the racetrack. Looking through the crew cam, you will see that Kirk Sheldon and the crew are looking at the tires and they look at the side of the car trying to determine if there's a problem with the car. And apparently now Sheldon talking to Earnhardt via the two-way radio. Earnhardt's still sitting here. Now he puts it back in here and drives off. He's trying to get a comment as to what the problem may be. Richard, what's the problem with the car? What are you checking? Something broken under the front. Well, something broken under the front end. Apparently Earnhardt said it's a lot more serious than they originally believed. So they're possibly going to pull the car back on pit road. They may pull it behind the wall and do some work on it. So we'll check with us in a minute to see what, what's going to happen here in the Goodrich pit. Back to green. Uh, 
tough break for Dale Earnhardt because the green flag has come out once again, and Dale is in the pits once again. So Earnhardt, who led the race as we have the crew cam now on Will Lynn as he unbuckles the hood on that car, they'll raise it and try to find out what broke on the car in the front end. Tough break for Dale Earnhardt as the crew cam takes you right in the motor area. The uh, hood is, you can see, blocking our signal just a little bit. He's looking underneath the car to see if he can determine exactly what's wrong. The hood blocks the uh, signal that is sent to our helicopter and then back down to Earth. That's the reason why we had the slight break up there. Now he's going to the toolbox to uh, select a wrench that might correct this problem. Dale Earnhardt, there's Kirk Shelverdine working there on the left front of the race car as he's inside trying to check it over and find out what's wrong. Meanwhile, out on the racetrack, the leader is Davey Allison in car number 28, and he is the 16th leader. And remember, he has come to the lead from our provisional, one of two provisional starts in this race. The second place car is Jeff Bodine. Running third is Sterling Marlin. Fourth is Phil Parsons. And in fifth position is the sixth car, I believe, of Mark Martin. I can give you fans at home a little bit to look for. Davey Allison's car, if you look at it close when he gets to the back straightaway, has a nice white wall ring on his tire. That's a Goodyear tire. The Goodyears paint the white letters that say Goodyear a lot brighter than, say, Jeff O'Dine, who's on Hoosiers right behind him. Looks like he has black wall tires. That's Hoosiers and Goodyears. Jeff O'Dine, black wall tires, has Hoosiers. Davey Allison with the white walls has Goodyears. You can spot that from your home steps. And one thing that makes the Goodyears look wider, there's more riding on it. The words Goodyear and Eagle, where there's only one word with the Hoosier, and so that makes it uh, much easier to see. That's why we can just look at on the, the racetrack many times and see what brand of tires they are running. As you can see, Davey Allison, Goodyear, uh, Jeff Bodine, Hoosiers, and the 94 car Sterling Marlin Hoosiers. You can tell black walls versus white walls. So Davey Allison, Jeff Bodine, the Sunday afternoon for live NASCAR Winston Cup racing today from Darlington, or rather from Bristol International, Bristol, Tennessee, and we are 200 laps from the end of the competition. It is uh, Sterling Marlin in the number 94 car that's running in third, and you can see as he tries to let Jeff Bodine that, uh, know that he's back there and would like that second spot. Bumped him just a little bit. Now he's trying to work down on the inside, but there's no room there. Davey Allison, of course, leading, and Jeff Bodine running second. Bill Parsons back in the pick of it after that spin running in fourth place, and then right behind him is Mark Martin. Martin certainly has an extra challenge here today as a result of winning the pole. He could, if he could win the race, he'd pick up $30,400 extra from Unical. The Unical 76 challenge. That is, if the driver wins the pole, he wins the race. So they're the first five cars running nose to tail. Davey Allison in number 28, the leader of the race. This is the second consecutive race that he has led. He also led a few laps at Darlington last week. Now, let's go to Jerry Punch on Pit Road, who can update us on what is the problem with Dale Earnhardt's car, Jerry. We're with Richard Childers, the car owner. Richard, what's the problem with the car now? Well, when he came into pit, we hit the uh, tire off uh, little Walter's car there. We bent the front end, not bent the toe end, and we just tried to fix it earlier, and it couldn't, so we had to come back in and fix it. So a bent left front tie rod, and apparently on pit road, Earnhardt, as he was coming in, hit the tire off the Mike Walker car, and it just up pit road from him, and that's what caused the problem. Of course, they said little Waltrip, uh, Michael is the biggest of the two Waltrip that's on the racetrack right now, and also Michael Waltrip is the fastest race car on the racetrack. He again passed Davy Allison just after the green came out and has ran off and left him. So he has gotten another of his laps back with the problems that he had earlier. So Michael Waltrip is getting himself back in the thick of this thing, ready to fly. All right, let's take a look now at our Napa race summary. The leader, 28, Davy Allison. He had led 14 of the 300 laps at an average speed of 70.873. 16 leaders, 20 lead changes, 16 cars on the lead lap, and we've had a total of 13 cautions and uh, 77 laps run under that caution flag. Out of the race, Ken Schrader with an accident very early. Butch Miller and Ernie Irvin also involved in accidents, as were Hutt Strickland and Brett Bodine. And the 94 car goes to second, passing Jeff Bodine. Also out of the contest via crashes, Bobby Hillen Jr., Morgan Shepard, and Terry Labonte. All drivers okay, but we have seen some pretty hellacious crashes here. 
the 94 car of Sterling Marlin is in second position, following now the Davy Allison number 28 car. It's been a good run for Sterling Marlin, despite the fact that he was involved in a spin over in turn number two with Bill Parsons. Jeff Bodine in car number five is in third position. So we've got some great competition going on here, and we've still got Jeff Ford in. Robert Yates drops the right side, comes around to the left. The left nuts are already off, and on goes four new Goodyears. Gasman is already, as soon as they tighten the lug nuts, he's ready to go. The car is down, and Jerry Punch taking it away. Jeff put on, getting left side. Levi Garrett Chevrolet, he is racing down Pippo with Dale Earnhardt and Davey Allison. That looks like Bodine will beat Davey Allison back on the racetrack. Remember, must stay below that white line going around the turn one and two. So Bodine will be the leader as far as pit stops are concerned. Number three car beat everybody up but he's 13 laps down this is the reason why we are under caution dale jarrett spending coming off of corner number four it looks like he might have had a tire go down or just lost it i'm not sure dale had hit the wall on the back stretch earlier after blowing a right front tire and he spins uh, here bringing out the caution no damage to his car well these caution periods allow us to take our commercial for green has just come out once again at bristol for resumption of the valley dale 500 and the lead is held by the number nine car of bill Elliott running second is the 21 of Neil Bonnet and third is the 16 of Larry Pearson then uh, Greg Sachs and Harry Gant. Two cars however are ahead of Bill Elliott in the red number nine they are the number 30 car of Michael Waldrop the yellow one and the black number three of Dale Earnhardt but Earnhardt is some 13 laps down to the leader. Now Mike Waldrop had been five laps down to the leader but he has now made up three of them so he's only two down if he can stay out in front of Bill Elliott. Side of Dale Earnhardt off of corner number two down the back stretch into three. Michael passes Dale. Well, that 30 car continues stronger and stronger as the day goes on. Every time it seems like he, he's out for the day, he spins out and gets in a couple real close scrapes, and now he's really regaining several laps. And earlier he had on Hoosier tires, and we thought that might be the reason that he was running, but I believe he has Goodyear on the car now, Gary, and uh, he's still running very fast. You're <laughs> right, man. the cars that are ahead of the leader and there is the leader Bill Elliott in car number nine now the 17 car of Darrell Waltrip involved with some racing there's Jim Sauter at number 31 Mark Martin at number six Rick Wilson at number four and 66 car of Rick Mast Darrell in 17 is running unofficially in 10th position Rusty Wallace there in the number 27, as uh, also here are Jeff Bodine in number 5, Davey Allison in 28, who was a leader until just a moment ago, and uh, also Sterling Marlin. Let's go down to Jerry Punch, who has a report on the number 5 Bodine car. Well, Jeff Bodine was very, very lucky that Dale, Ern Dale Jarrett spun and called that last caution flag. Let me show why. Bodine was running in third place, and he had a hole in the right rear tire. The tire was going down. He didn't know it. Had he not come in on that lap, this tire would have been completely flat on the rim and Bodine could have ended up in the wall. So a lucky day so far for Jeff Bodine. Well, of course, he has fresh tires on now. Bob, there were four cars that did not hit during that last caution. Bill Elliott did not. He's running first. And Neil Bonnie, who's running second, did not. Greg Sachs, who is running third, did not. And Harry Gant, who's running fourth, did not. So those front four cars are on tires that have been on there for a little while, but they felt that they were okay, so they just stayed out there. Well, they, certainly Neil Bonnet and Greg Sachs have both moved in on Bill Elliott. There is really 10 or 13 cars, maybe, that could still win this race. This late, at these late stages in the race, a lot of guys like Daryl Walter don't know. Is he just keeping his nose clean, staying out of trouble? Here's uh, Neil Bonnet, Greg Sachs. Bill Elliott, I don't know about Bill. He seems to fall back a little bit. But how many of these other guys that are staying back are just because they want to stay out of trouble and are going to save something for them? Coming into the Valley Dale 500 last year, Dale Earnhardt was the points leader. Eventual champion Elliott, who is the leader at this point, was sixth, no, sixth in points, 98 behind. Now in 1989, he 
currently is in 13th place in the point standings, 189 behind Alan Kowicki. So Bill Elliott with still a long way to go in his defense of the Winston Cup, but nevertheless, his last two races have been very, very impressive. Now, however, here's Neil Bonnet trying to make a move on Bill Elliott, coming off the of corner number four. They cross the line, and Elliott has the advantage, but, ooh, Neil really trying to wrestle that first place away from Elliott. So you can see four cars there running very tightly behind Neil is the car number 88 of Greg Saxon, then Harry Gant. That's the first four position that we're seeing on the screen. Bonnet closes in on Bill Elliott in corner number four. Can't take away the top spot, though. They move high to pass the 67 car. That's driven by Brad Teague and the You Can't Rent Pontiac. You Can't Rent people are giving this kind of a trial basis as to whether they want to stay involved in Winston Cup competition. But for this race, You Can't Rent on the side of that 67 Buddy Emerson car driven by Brad Teague. And now the others have caught up. There's Larry Pearson running in fifth place. He has caught them, and right behind him is Jeff Bodine. So we've got a freight train, train of cars. In fact, the first 10 are within striking distance. The 11 car of Terry Labonte has come back out. As we see Neil Bonnet take the lead of Bill Elliott getting past twice there as Red Sack goes by two. Elliott just a little bit high going out of corner number two, and that was all that Neil Bonnet and Greg Sachs needed to pass. Now Elliott finds himself in third position and being pressured by last week's winner, Harry Gann. Also right there is the 16 car of Larry Pearson. He's had a fine run. He has. He got a lap down as a result of being involved in the spin earlier in the race, but he got that lap back by being out in front of the leader when a caution came out. Here's Jeff Lodine trying to get on the inside of Larry Pearson, but Pearson has had a good run as a rookie. Well, it's going to be decision time here in about 65 laps for the crew chiefs. they got to decide what kind of tires they want to have on for the last 100 laps of the race. NASCAR has a rule that says whatever tires you have on with 100 laps to go, you have to keep that brand on. You can change tires, but they have to be the same brand. And in fact, NASCAR comes through the pits and makes the crew chiefs move the other brand out of the pit area so they won't, put, they won't be switching to one tire or the other in the last 100 laps. Here is uh, Harry Gant moving to the inside of Bill Elliott and taking over third position. So Elliott is slipping back here. And Jeff Bodine now moves up to uh, challenge Bill. So Elliott has gone from first to fourth in about five or six laps. Yes, he has. And Jeff Bodine has on fresh tires, fresher tires than those four cars in front of him. Now Greg Sachs trying to make a move for the lead in turn one. Boy, Greg Sachs has really shown a lot. And here comes Jeff Bodine along, too. And goes into third position. Here comes Sterling Marlin in 94. Now he's in sixth. Look at Bill Elliott, who's caught up top. Last week, just a tremendously impressive run by Greg Sachs in car number 988. There is Bill Elliott, who again is uh, caught up top and lost up a position. Here comes uh, Rusty Wallace also. There may be a problem with this Elliott car. Jerry, what can you tell us? We are down in the Elliott pit with Dan Elliott. Getting here. Then the car is back sliding. Is there a problem with the car? Not that I know of. Bill's not said anything on the radio. I imagine that a wrist is bothering him a little bit. Tires may be giving up a, a little bit. Just have to wait and see. They don't really know what the problem may be, but all they do know is that Bill Elliott is back sliding through the field. Well, now here is Elliott and Rusty Wallace. Uh, going to the inside of Neil Bonnet, who got caught up on the higher groove. And he still is, as a matter of fact. Here's Alan Kowicki below him. Now he'll settle down into that lower groove. Boy, there's some strange things going on out there. Just uh, one car will be fast for a moment, then all of a sudden everybody blows them off. But Greg Sachs holding off Harry Gant, at least at the moment. There you can see the 89 results for Greg Sachs. 40th, 9th, 26th, and 34th. And that 25th place, you see there, brief door handle to door handle and nose to tail with six cars, the first six cars running nose to tail on the racetrack. Harry Gant has just gone in the lead, passing the 88 car, Greg Sachs. 
Third is Bodine. Fourth is Sterling Marlin. Fifth is Larry Pearson. And sixth is Jim Sauter. Here's a replay of how Greg Sachs lost the lead. He went a little high going into turn one. And Harry Gant dipped down on the inside, took advantage of it. Here comes Jeff Bodine. But he couldn't quite make the pass that time. Let's go to the pits and Jerry Punch. Is there something wrong? Or no, Harry Gant seems to be going strong, Jerry. Well, Ned Harry is running very strong. And you know, in this uh, day and age of specialized cars, they have cars for short tracks, cars for intermediate tracks, and speedway cars. Harry Gant's crew, run by Leo Jackson and Andy Petrie, have one car they like the best. This car they have here in Bristol, Tennessee. It's the same car they won with last week at Darlington here on ESPN. The same car they ran in Atlanta. The same car they ran in Richmond. And the same car they ran in Rockingham. They ran this car four of the first five events. It's Harry's favorite car. And I'll tell you what he runs right now. It's going to be his favorite car for quite some time. Gentlemen, great racing here. Greg Sachs, Larry Pearson, and the 31 car of Jim Sauter. This is for fourth and fifth spot. The 31 car driven by Sauter has been down one lap on three different occasions during pit stops, but has battled back each time. He's having a very good run in the Bob Clark Motorsports Twin Review. Those or Pontiac, that is, this year. And here's Larry Pearson making a pass on Greg Sachs. Greg's tires apparently has given up on the Crisco Pontiac. Well, he was the leader, but now finds himself back into a sixth position. Not only new pavement, Gary, but I think just Bristol in general, when you run this hard on this kind of a high bank racetrack, those tires just don't last long. Well, definitely with the new pavement, but any time that you run as hard, you could almost see Greg Sack just driving that car as hard as it would go, and it really takes the edge off the tires. And a, a car like Gary Kent maybe wasn't abusing his tires quite so much and was able, as soon as Sack, Greg Sack's tires got hot, was able to move on by him. And then really it was a matter of time before the rest of the, the lead pack went on by Greg Sack. Watching fourth position here and fifth. Jim Sauter in 31 and 15, where there's 16, Larry Pearson. They approach some slower traffic, Eddie Birchwell. Meanwhile, it is a good battle for second position. And here is Harry Gant, who is trying to put a lap. In fact, he does put a lap on Rick Mann. I now, wonder if he's getting tired, Bob. I because, wonder the same thing, Ned. You know, he was running up there in second place not too long ago. He had the flu, which was yesterday, was just feeling terrible. In fact, Dale Jarrett was going to drive his Bush Grand National car into the 200 had that race been run. But uh, I believe that Rick Mast is, is getting very tired week from now. By the way, that Bush Grand National race that was uh, postponed yesterday because of rain will be run at 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, local time here in Bristol. Uh, they originally had scheduled it for a morning start, but Larry Carrier, the owner of the track, has crashed up at turn three and involves uh, Phil Parsons. Just to finish that thought, uh, Larry Carrier, the owner of the track, decided that it would be much better for the fans if they started at one o'clock, so that's the time the Bush Grand National Race will start tomorrow. We bring out our... Is this the, yes, this is, the record-tying 15th caution flag of the day, and the reason for it, Phil Parsons spinning in turn number two. And when we say record, that's the, it ties the record here at Bristol for number of caution flags. The all-time record is 17 at Martinsville, and so we're approaching that all-time record. I think we may be in uh, pretty good shape to break that record today. Only two more, and we'll tie it. Three more would break the all-time number of caution flags during a Winston Cup race. Well, this is decision time for the crew chiefs. Whatever tires they put on might be the ones for the end. Let's go to Benny Parsons in Greg Sachs' pit. Greg Sachs is making a suggestion to the pit crew, trying to get their attention, but he can't. I don't know what he's trying to tell them. They're changing four tires, putting the four Hoosiers back on, and away he goes. Greg Sachs moving out. Here's Harry Gant. Already gotten right side powers, and now Charlie Presley, Andy Petrie, and his gold crew will change left side rough. Now, Gant has been good year all the way. He's been having the good year cars up at the beginning of the race. They put four more. They're down on the way. Good pit stop for the lead car. Here he gets. He pulls out of the pits ahead of Rusty Wallace and Sterling Marlin. Jeff Bodine is the leader now. The lead by Garrett Chevrolet. And I believe in second position would be Greg Sachs. Thank you very much, Cliff. We are back at Bristol International Raceway and the Valleydale 500 Winston Cup race. And Greg Sachs is the leader in the blue car. Rick Mass trying to unlap himself as Dale Earnhardt has already pulled out in front and Neil Bonney in front of Greg Sachs. Neil had had some problems, made a green flag pit stop, so he's uh, several laps down. But 
Well, when we uh, went to break, Jeff Bodine was in the lead, but he made a pit stop, and that put Greg Sachs in the lead. However, he had made a pit stop earlier. Let's go to Benny Parsons, who can show us the tire that came off of Greg's car. 